right, baby, we are back. Technical Knockouts, the Hardcore Casual MMA Podcast. I'm your host, Hussein. With me, as always, my co-host, Jordan Patrick James. What's going on, guys? We are going to talk about UFC 301 today, and uh, we're going to break down a bit of next week's St. Louis card featuring Derek Lewis and Rodrigo Nascimento. All right. First off, let's talk about what happened in Brazil last week. Um, pretty awesome card, honestly, all things uh, considered. Uh, it all shaked out. It was um, not a lot of uh, crazy names on the card. You know, the first pay per view after UFC 300. It's understandable they didn't, they weren't able to get massive stars on here. But we were able to see the return of a legend, a very close and competitive flyweight title fight, which are always fun, and some uh, pretty pretty cool finishes throughout the night. Um, let's start from the top. Alexandre Pantoja defends his belt against Steve Ersig at home in Brazil against the Australian. And uh, it was a really good fight, dude. Uh, Steve Ersig is a very, very good fighter. He's he's super well-rounded. He's got great hands. His, his hand speed is nasty. His shot selection is really, is really nice. And um, more than anything, you know, I think uh, what surprised me a lot in this fight was his composure. Um, you know, being in enemy territory with a sold-out crowd in Brazil, going against a dominant champion who, you know, has a couple defenses and, you know, before he became the champion, beat a lot of the top ten. Um, Ersig showed up massively in this fight. And uh, in my opinion was well on his way to winning until he shot that takedown in the fifth round and got reversed. Um, And the judges thought so, too, uh, because that fifth round was the deciding round uh, on two of the scorecards. So, unfortunate for Ersic, but, you know, that's really where the experience uh, difference shows itself, is in those moments like that at the end of the fight. And, uh, you know, choosing when to sit on a lead or when to push for it. And that's something that Alessandro Pantoja has in spades is experience. So um, not necessarily a surprising finish to the fight. Uh, I think a lot of people had picked Pantoja to win. Um, but what was surprising was how it ended up there. Jordan, did you he, did he get a chance to catch this one or see the highlights? I watched a lot, yeah, I watched a lot of the highlights. And Steve Ersig definitely proved that he belonged in there. I mean, I think indicative of that is that he... Came into this fight ranked number 10, came out off of a loss, and actually went up a spot. He is now ranked number 9, which I think that might even be a little bit too low, considering the performance that he turned in against Pantoja. And as you said, if it weren't for, you know, I don't even want to call it a low IQ move because it was such a high-profile fight against such a high-profile, it's just a Mm slip-up. Um the one thing I do like as well is um as I was kind of like reading through one of the 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 taglines or sound bites that you hear from him is I blew it. You know, mm-hmm. I just blew it. You know, he takes accountability for it. And so I think you might end up seeing this this individual be the future of the flyweight division. But again, this is going to depend on how he is able to rebound from this loss. You see a lot of guys that, you know, we talk about it, you know, time and time again that they get into this uh, this bright lights, they get into the spotlight, they get that championship, you know, uh, fight, and they fall a little bit short, showing that they do belong they belong with that champion. But then after that, they either take that slide or they take that big jump up. So I'm I'm excited to see which way Steve Ersic um, um, Ersic goes from here. But I think that he will end up being the future of the flyweight division. Yeah, I mean, I I think uh, you know give him a couple more fights i think he uh he beat he beats pantoja in a rematch honestly um especially as pantoja starts to age out and ersig is only like what 28 29 yeah he's a young cat yeah he's got plenty of time uh and to put in that kind of performance in your fourth ufc fight against a a great champion like pantoja uh is nothing short of spectacular so shout out steve ersig he um you know won the fight in our hearts or at least you know um showed up incredibly well uh in this fight card so and fight and you know and we kind of kind of mentioned it a little bit but glazed over it but you know fighting in anime tour ter- territory you know yeah. in the main event in brazil uh, against a brazilian you know and coming off and showing that type of performance yeah you know, that's that's a that's quite an accomplishment you know he shouldn't yeah. hang his head out at all 
Yeah, I think they'll give him a nice top five matchup after this. I hope so, at least. And, you know, get him back in the win column. Um, maybe give him a top ten guy and then a top five guy and then put him right back in there for a title shot, I think. You know, I, I, I just... I, I feel like um, he really made a name for himself in that fight. And uh, I'm personally really excited to see his next fight, and I think a lot of the fans are too. So uh, the oyster is yours, you know, or whatever. The world is your oyster. <laughs> uh, good job, Steve. Um, and for Pantoja, you know, just as as we come to expect, the guy is great at winning rounds in fights. He looks like he's exhausted all the time and still pushes through. Um and, you know, that's why he's the champion, man. The guy has a, a very methodical game, and when he gets on top, it's very hard to get him off. And if you shoot for a takedown, like Ersig found out, he's a great scrambler and, you know, does a great job of finding his way to the top position or, you know, threatening submissions off his back in order to get you to stand up. So, you know, just more of what we know from Pantoja. I see a lot of people saying that this fight was a robbery. Uh, saying that Steve Ersig won the fifth round regardless of the takedown because he did more damage. I understand the mentality. Uh, I get it. You know, damage is the number one criteria, et cetera, et cetera. We always talk about it. But, you know, we all know if you're in Brazil against a Brazilian champion and you get put on your back for the last two minutes of the fight, you probably lost that round, you know. Uh, I think in general it's a bad visual to end the fight on your back, uh, especially whenever it's, you know... A prolonged period of time there it's not just you get taken down in the last 15 seconds like if it was a last second takedown it might have been a different story but for him to have that top control for for like two minutes at the end of the fight that's yeah. enough for me to win a round that was pretty close before that so um i thought pantoja won i thought the fight was right there for ersig though and uh absolutely no shame in losing like that so Solid fight, man, and definitely deserved fight of the night. I think it was honestly one of the best fights I've seen this year. So I'm, I'm, I really don't know why they didn't give it fight of the night. Maybe they didn't want to reward Pantoja for not threatening finishes on the top position. I get that. That's, you know, kind of weird, but that's usually how the UFC operates. Um, but yeah, uh, regardless, that was an awesome fight. So going down the card, you got the return of the goat Jose Aldo and uh, him showing us why we hold him in such high regard. You know. The guy comes back after, a, what, like a three-year layoff, something like that, um, at least in the MMA realm, and puts in a vintage Aldo performance against a very tough competitor in Jonathan Martinez, who was on like a six-fight win streak, um, just turns him back pretty easily there. Um, did you get a chance to see this fight, Jordan? Or did you no, but I, I did read a lot about it, and it just I was hoping that Martinez was going to be able to get a little bit something more going against Jose, but dude, fucking Jose is obviously still there. You know, I'm yeah. excited. It makes me more excited to see his boxing um, the exhibitions that are going to come up after this. You know, he'll get some paydays from that, but he looked good, man. I feel like if he wanted to make another run at it, he could definitely beat some of the top top ten contenders or at least put some fights in there but good for him retiring on top finishing out his contract you know getting on to go do other things and you know ending in a much uh better fashion not only with the w but ending in brazil as well yeah. so I'm, I'm happy for him i'm very happy for him and i wish him all the luck in the future we're gonna have to make a little revision on our uh on our uh piece Which on him do. thank thanks a lot jose but yeah yeah, I mean, you know, he kind of left the door open uh, after the fight. He was saying, like, you know, I, I could fight Sean O'Malley right now and probably beat him and things probably. like that. I mean, um, I wouldn't. I would maybe. I mean, anything's possible. As long as, it's not, as long as he's not fighting Marab. <laughs> yeah, I don't want to see him fight Jan again. I don't want to see him fight Marab again. Um, but, you know, if, I mean, he beat Cheeto already, so... I don't know, man. If he wants to stay in MMA, he's obviously still got the talent for it. You know, turning back Jonathan Martinez like that is no easy feat. Um, but, you know, I know I, there's more money for him in boxing, so... Yeah, I think the second he sees uh, that first check from boxing, he's going to be like, fuck the UFC. Yeah, I get that, yeah. Yeah, I'm not going to do that again. We'll see how they do. Um, but, you know, regardless, um, as far as the fight goes... Martinez really wasn't able to get much done, as you alluded to, um, largely because of Aldo's defense. Uh, we've always known Aldo to be one of the best defensive fighters of all time, and uh, he certainly hasn't lost a step in that regard. Um, on Saturday, he, he just his defense looked so tight. Anytime Martinez threw a leg kick, it was checked. 
Anytime he threw a straight left hand, it bounced off the gloves or the guard of Aldo. Um, and Aldo was able to return with some, some viciousness, man, with some ferocity. Uh, he landed some nice body shots, which was lovely to see. We love seeing Jose Aldo's body shots. They're some of the best in the biz. Uh, landed some good leg kicks of his own and a couple of knees. So when I say vintage Aldo, I don't just mean in the sense that he was winning the fight, but he was using tools that we haven't seen from him since, you know, the WEC days or early UFC days, you know, um, where in these last few fights uh, that he won in the octagon, it was largely his boxing and his uh, wrestling that got him the victory here. Um, it was cool to see him pull out some of that Muay Thai game again and use those knees to the body, use those leg kicks like we know him for. And the boxing, of course, too, was, was spectacular. You know, after training for boxing for the last couple of years, um, it certainly showed in the crispness of Aldo's uh, punches and the pivots. My goodness. I You know, we talked about it on that uh, career retrospective piece when we look back at Jose Aldo's whole career. Um, but his pivots are are something beautiful and uh, something that young fighters really should study if they're looking at ways to be defensively smart in the octagon. Um, the way he moves around the octagon, and when I say pivot, I mean, you know, Martinez is coming at him on a straight line, throwing his one-two, throwing his leg kick, uh, trying to, you know, keep Aldo corralled. And uh, before you know it, Aldo, when he's standing right in front of him, ends up off to the side and Martinez is throwing at thin air. Um, and he did that a couple times in this fight, and it was absolutely beautiful. So, great job, Jose Aldo. You still got it, kid. Uh, 37 years old and, you know, still putting in master class performances. So. Um, and then at the end of the fight, when Martinez finally started to build some offense, Aldo just took him down and held him down. And uh, once he got him down, it was like, oh, yeah, you're not going anywhere. That's right. This guy used to hold down 45 or he's no problem. So, um, you know, the strength showed there. And for Martinez, a frustrating performance, especially coming off of that win streak that he had going. Uh, not really... Sorry, what were you saying? No, I mean, it's like I said, it's just... Uh, I mean, it's good for him. I imagine that he'll probably grow a lot from this. And I like. I did see you know, the, the shots of Jose Aldo consoling Martinez after it, you know. You know, he don't, he, it's, it's just one of the things, man. You run up a legend, you know, you're going you're gonna to learn some stuff. Yeah. You know, this is a great opportunity. Same thing we're talking about with Ursig. You know, that's just a it's a great opportunity. Unfortunately, not as great a performance. But anytime you step in there with a goat like that and get to trade trade with him, it's it. it I expect Martinez to continue to grow back, grow from this as well. You know, um, it's just they like said disappointed that he couldn't get more going. I hope but so. You think a little bit. You think uh, you know, kind of what we're talking about with with Ursig. Do you think that? Maybe the enemy territory got to him. Maybe the the fighting a Jose Aldo got to him because um, it doesn't sound like Jonathan Martinez was anything like himself. No, nah, yeah, I mean, you know, honestly, I think uh, it's a combination of things. I think for sure he had a little bit of that starstruck um, feeling that sometimes you see fighters have when they have a legend across from them. Daniel Cormier talked about it on the fight. He said that he felt it when he fought Anderson Silva. It's like, oh shit! Like that's Anderson Silva. Like, what do we? Yeah, you know? John Jones was saying that he felt that whenever he fought um, Shogun, I think, right? Rampage. Oh, Rampage. Yeah, that's what it mm -hmm. was. Yeah. So I mean, yeah, like you know, I, I think there was definitely a factor of that for sure. But honestly, um, just stylistically, it was a tough fight for Jonathan Martinez to get done. And I think in a rematch, like we talked about, if Ursig got a rematch, there's a good chance that he wins that fight against Pantoja. You know, it really came down to like one or two decisions yeah. that he made. He fights Aldo Martinez. again. He yeah, Martinez gets probably KO'd maybe. Maybe not KO'd, but I I I don't think he could do much more to Aldo. Um, it really seemed like Aldo had all the correct defenses for Martinez's best attacks, and Martinez was forced to kind of go to his B and C game, which is holding guys against the fence or trying to take them down. And you're just not going to take down Jose Aldo like that. You know what I mean? If Rob Devalish really couldn't do it, if Chad Mendes couldn't do it consistently. Jonathan Martinez is certainly not going to do it. So really just a, a tough stylistic matchup for Martinez. Um, and, you know, we talked about it before the fight that Aldo had every tool to win, but we questioned his, uh, you know, motivations or, you know, how he would look uh, coming off of the layoff. Um, but I think, you know, even in knowing what he's capable of, I think we underestimated him. And uh, I'm happy that Aldo was able to turn that performance. For Jonathan Martinez, it really sucks. Because to build up a win streak like that in this division is very tough. 
and it's going to be a long time for him to get that kind of opportunity again or to get a top five or a top ten guy again, you know. Um, yeah. So that blows. But the guy is Speak- pretty young. He still has time. I say, speaking of underestimating, who I underestimated is Anthony Smith. Man, got it done. Look at yeah. that. Fucking didn't didn't waste any time either. Yeah, no, that was yeah. I, I couldn't believe it. You know, uh, Vita Petrino was the last leg of a couple of my parlays, and before the fight, I was looking at the the cash out option, and I was like, I just I don't know. I don't feel right. Something feels wrong. You know what I mean? Like I had Petrino by a knockout or by points. And I was like, my head what was feeling wrong. I was like, maybe Petrino, Petrino could win by submission, though. You know what I mean? So I cashed out, thank God. Um, and then the fight started, and Petrino looked pretty good on the feet. He landed some nice leg kicks, and then went for a takedown for some god awful reason. And you know, not only is it that he went for a takedown, it's a bad idea when you're winning on the striking. But the way he went for the takedown was so sloppily. He shot from his knees. He just put his head right in in. Uh, in Anthony Smith's armpit, essentially, and gave him that guillotine, man. And, you know, after the fight, you know, Anthony Smith, of course, is going to take whatever submission that you give him. The guy's a black belt. He's been doing this for a long time. He has, like, 60 fights. And in the post-fight interview, he said something that I didn't even think about before the fight. He said, yeah, Vitor Petrino's tough, man. He's going to come back from this. He's only had 11 fights. I was like, holy shit, like, I didn't even think about that. Like, we're talking about a guy with 11 fights versus a guy with 60 fights. You know what yeah. I mean? And even though, you know, we talk about how Smith might be washed or whatever, he's still a dangerous dude. And, you know, he beat Ryan Spann not that long ago, so you know he can take a punch. Um, I thought Petrino, you know, I've always thought that Petrino looks like he has the skills to be a very strong fighter in this division. But, you know, obviously hindsight's twenty twenty. This guy went life and death with Anton Sir College. So, I mean, how, you know, how how good can he really be? And, you know, coming off of that victory over Tyson Pedro, another fight where I thought he'd smash his opponent, he was only able to, you know, not not scrape out. He, he won the fight clearly, but he won a decision victory over a guy who is always getting finished. So, you know, um... I think the chalk was a little bit too steep on Vitor Petrino, and anybody who took Smith in an underdog spot, congratulations. That was a great pick. Um, but, you know, thankfully I cashed out before the fight. But, yeah, it was it was, it was was crazy. Yeah, um, you got to think you gotta think Dustin Poirier was losing his mind watching that oh, somewhere, yeah, yeah. just being like, why can't someone just give me yeah. the guillotine? Yeah, the, the fucking Leonardo DiCaprio meme and him pointing out the TV. Like, <laughs> yeah, that, that's DP watching the Smith jump for it. Um, uh, but speaking of crazy shit... Michelle Pereira. Uh, oh God, dude. Yeah. Good. I he told submitted. you, dude. What? Yeah, dude. I told you him focused is scary. I was the looking at the lot, dude. He, dude. He's only spent he spent less than five minutes in the cage in his last three fights. Yeah, yeah. He's just he playing is, middleweights back, no problem, man. Dude, once he decided to like learn the controls, he fucking <laughs> got really good. Like, yeah, I mean, he still did his spazzy shit in this fight. I don't know. Did you see that backflip? Yeah, but it's like, it's not as wild, you know what I'm he saying? He landed like, it. He landed it <laughs> the to the head, and then everybody was just like, oh, that might be illegal, but the ref was like, that was so fucking sick, like, <laughs> was like, that was way too sick, I'm not gonna stop this fight, really crazy, like, that shit was cool as fuck. So, Petrino, or uh, not Petrino, Pereira, he hurt him with, with something in the clinch, I don't, I don't remember if it was a left hook or a right straight, uh, and then, you know, he, he dropped Portieria. And immediately <laughs> is like in the up down position and just does a fucking backflip and Lance's knee crashes it on uh, puts the areas you know face and chest. Rev's just like I'll allow it. Yeah, Rev's like yeah, exactly. Overruled. Uh, the fucking uh, puts the area gets up, tries to you know wrestle up and uh, Pereira gets that high elbow guillotine and just fucking cranks oh, it off. Oh Jesus. And then, you know, in, in a crazy turn of events, Putieria taps and then goes unconscious. You know, I don't know if... I mean, we've seen it a couple times. I remember Kevin Lee, when he fought Charles Oliveira, he tapped and then Ooh. was out. Like, after he tapped, Justin Gaethje also uh, against Oliveira, tapped and then fell asleep. So, you know, he went out on his dying breath. And uh, the way he laid out after the fight, it was like, holy shit, he caught a body. like, And it took 50 seconds, like... This guy's a monster, man. Michelle Pereira is a fucking beast. And, you know, I took him in first or second round. I also, you know, uh, put a prop out on first round submission 
because I think a lot of people were picking him by KO, but you know he's gotten plenty of submissions in his career. I think most recently he just submitted Oleg Satrick in the first round, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, so the guy's a monster, and I'm I'm really excited to see where he goes from here. They they put him in the rankings now at like 13, I think Four, it was at middle. Yeah, eight. like 13, so, 14, I think. Yeah, so hopefully he can um, he can get some 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 more fights here because the dude is uh, very fun to watch. Um, <sighs> Next, we got our boy Kyle Baraglio getting it done against done, Paul baby. Craig. Yeah, I mean, I think we all saw this coming. Um, at least, you know, I can say that me and Jordan definitely did. We've been high on Baraglio for a long time. And um, we know that he likes to grapple with strikers and strike with grapplers. Um, we've talked about before that he kind of placed his opponent's weaknesses, very similar to like a GSP or, you know, a Valentina Shevchenko or anybody like that. Um and that was certainly the case here. It was only a matter of time. Um, Paul Craig sucks on the feet. And Kyle Borelli was happy to exploit that uh, using that boxing of his and eventually finding that knockout in the second round. I had him to win over one and a half, so I was a little upset that he got it done 20 seconds before that mark. But I also had him by knockout or by decision, so I was able to make money either way. And uh, happy to see Borelli keep that momentum rolling. And he also got put in the rankings now. So um. yeah, well, so yeah, I mean, we were kind of talking about this last week. If Michelle Pereira and Caio Barrio both got it done, uh, you know, maybe they could match up because they obviously have the same you know recovery time, twelve yeah. and thirteen. It's a good matchup, or I don't know. I'd like to see that matchup, but maybe uh, one or two fights down the line. I want them to keep their rankings and kind of keep on on grinding. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, I mean, I think. I don't think you need to put them against each other. You know, I think they're both relative. Like they are. They both just debuted in the in the rankings, so they're both new blood in the middleweight. I'd like to see them fight some of these old guard guys. You know, uh, maybe Nasruddin Imovov or you know Chris Curtis or any of these dudes. I would like to see them matched up with uh, with Pereira uh, versus Dolizze. That's what I want to see. Yeah, Dolizze is supposed to fight. Um, Hernandez recently, and I think Hernandez fell out. So I mean, if if he's if he's still looking for an opponent, I'm sure Pereira would be happy to oblige, and that would be a pretty cool fight. Delete says very hard to kill, and Pereira is a killer, so that's an interesting matchup right there. Um, yeah, we'll see what happens. Uh, and then going down to the prelims. Um, oh, dude, what the? F- did you see this? What, Joe Anderson Brito? No, 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 Jack. Yeah, yeah, the Jack Shore and Joe Anderson Brito. Did you see the end of that? I did, yeah. yeah. Dude, what? what did you think? I didn't understand it. Like, he's bleeding from his knee or his his shin. It's okay. Like, you guys can continue the fight. Did you see what the doctor did? Yeah, he was like pushing around and everything. Oh, he then, fucking stuck his whole finger inside the hole. It was like, yeah, bro, what are you doing? Yeah, and like, well, and here's my thing. Jack Shore's not even flinching, so it's like, if you're literally fingering his wound hole, it's like, okay, you're pretty good. It looks like he opened it up more. Yeah. Was like, what are we like, doing, bro? I was so mad. It, that fight was starting to pick up, too. It was a gross cut. Don't get me wrong. You know yeah. what I mean? But, but, it, like, but just like they were saying on commentary, like, that's what's going to happen whenever you get kicked in the shin a lot, and yeah. then a cut opens up. It's going gonna, it's gonna to bleed a little bit. Shin on like, shin violence, you know. Yeah, I was pretty, I was pretty upset that day because, like I said, it was just starting to pick up. I was getting excited, getting into it. Yeah, like that was what? What round was that? That was second was round. Second round, yeah. And yeah, I, like, literally halfway through the second round. Yeah, and you know, I, I, I thought Brito was gonna smoke him in the first or get smoked by a decision, um, but Brito in this fight and in his last fight has shown that he can get a finish in the second round as well. So, good on Brito. Um, that leg kick was there from him from the opening bell. Uh, so, you know, he was able to exploit that and just keep running it until Shore couldn't continue, or at least until the doctor deemed that he couldn't continue. Um, we've seen guys have a split on their leg before, on their shin before, and continue the fight no problem. I remember Mark Hunt had a really bad one against Bigfoot Silva, if, I'm, if I remember correctly. Um, Fabrizio Verdum had one. You know, it, it is what it is, man. It, you know, this happens when you, you're throwing light kicks and sometimes they, they bounce off of each other. Um, so I thought that was a weird stoppage. I, I thought it was weird how he put his finger in the hole, too. It's like, bro, that's not really what you're supposed to be doing. You know what I mean? Like, you, like you're supposed to, like, try to make the wound stop bleeding, not fucking, oh, let me spread it open and make and sure maybe, it's all good. Uh, 
He's like one of the old school doctors. We must let the blood out. Yeah, yeah. Very, I'm sure he had a bag of leeches or something too. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> um, but yeah, that sucks for Jack Shore, uh, for Anderson Brito or for Joe Anderson Brito. Pretty fucking sweet though. You know what I mean? Can't be upset about that. Um, he was doing everything he should have done to get that victory. So, um, pretty good fight though. Regardless, it was shaping out to be a, a Brito win for sure. Um, and then Yasmin Lucindo just looked light years ahead of Carolina Kovalkovich. We knew this day was going to come. Kovalkovich on that four-fight win streak against shitty competition, and uh, they, they made her pay for it by putting her against a young, actually good fighter at strawweight. And uh, Lucindo was able to just, you know, have way crisper hands, way faster combinations, and land three punches for every one punch that Carolina threw. Um, so no surprise there. Uh, Carolina's uh, always tough though, so she was able to make it to that decision. She didn't have any trouble getting, you know, any threat of getting finished rather. Um, and then Oral by versus Brenner was oh, a pretty dude, interesting Dude, Jesus one. Christ, dude! Oral by needs to use his fucking hands, man. He out wrestled him so well, but it's like, dude, learn to finish. Yeah, yeah. I mean, he could have went for the. He could have finished him uh, in that first or second round. I think if he pushed it a little bit harder. Dude, but... hats off! To, hats off to Brenner for staying in there, staying tough, like you know, given their cause to be like, oh shit, we might see him pulled out. But. I was going to say, like, you know, we've seen Brenner come back on people when they thought that they had him finished before, so I kind of do like the fight IQ from Orobai to not unload the tank there and get exhausted. You know, I mean, Brenner has made a career off of these comebacks here. Um, you know, obviously most, uh, you know, the most prominent example being against Garam Kutathalatse, where Kutathalatse was finishing, like, it looked like he was going to finish him, and unloaded the tank on him and got absolutely knackered by the third round and got exhausted, and uh, Brenner was able to get that comeback on him. So I think that was fresh in Oral Bai's mind, and he was like, yeah, I'm not going to fucking, let me not get caught up like everybody else has against this guy, and uh, just fight a smart fight. And uh, he did that. He was able to wrestle him down. He got a point taken from him. I think it was the third round uh, yeah. for grabbing the fence. Um, so it would have been a 30-27, but, you know, uh, got that point taken. So it is what it is. I like that the ref didn't fool around and took the point immediately. That was cool to see. Um, and then Jakar Close versus Joaquin Silva. This another was... one, dude. Yeah, another one. Close should have fucking closed that out because Silva was coming back on him. Yeah, dude. I mean, he did, he really didn't have an opportunity to finish the fight, though. You know, Silva's so tough, man. And Close was was landing some good shots in the first round. He used that pressure, used that jab. Uh, second round was a little bit more of a grappling heavy round for him, and he was able to win it in my in my scorecard at least. Uh, held him against the fence, and you know, was able to neutralize Silva for the most part. And then the third round, it was like survival mode. Uh, Joaquin Silva came out really hot, dropped him in the clinch with that overhand over the top. And uh, Close looked all types of exhausted and hurt, uh, but was able to, you know, last to the decision. And um, although he did get beat up in that third round, it wasn't enough for a 10-8. So uh, he won 29-28. And, you know, I had Jakar Close in this fight. I bet on him, and I was worried sick because the judges in Brazil and uh, Joaquim Silva, you know, you might maybe make an argument that he won the second round if you weren't really paying attention or if you were biased. Um, so I was uh, I was very worried, but I was happy to see Jakar Close get that W. I think he's a much better fighter than Joaquim Silva, and if he would have lost uh, that decision, it would have been a big setback for his career, and I think he has a brighter future in this division, so I'm happy to get see him get that victory there. Um, Speaking of bright future, Mauricio Ruffy, he has a bright future. That dude fucked Malarkey up. Yeah, man, let me tell you, there was no Malarkey with that finish. You know? <laughs> the guy uh, <laughs> left no, no questions unanswered. Um, I saw uh, Dean Thomas comparing him to Conor McGregor on the uh, on the broadcast. I thought that was a little bit too early of a comparison, but um, I can see what he means because he has that very light, bouncy style. The distance management was really, really excellent. Um, anytime Malarkey came back on him, he was you know just out of range enough to able to come back with a counter, but not get hit with Malarkey's entry. So uh, very solid performance there, and then. You know, just to, you know, uh, fuck around and and show off for the hardcore fans, he threw up a flying scissor heel hook uh, attempt. Oh, yeah, that was nice. Takedown. That shit was sick, dude. I was like, oh, man, this guy's fucking, he's styling on him now, you know. Um, wasn't able to get anything with that takedown, but it was a very cool technique. And 
one of those things that you can't really practice in the training room without tearing your uh, training partner's knee apart. So um, I don't know if it's something he's been doing on the bag or something like that or on the bob, I should say. Um, but, you know, regardless, that was pretty sick. And it's cool to see people throw out some interesting techniques like that uh, in a cage fight. So uh, I'm really excited to see that guy's next fight. I had him by KO in this fight, and by early KO, Malarkey's chin is just not there these days, and um, although it was more of a volume finish than anything, uh, Ruffy looked incredible, so I'm excited to see his next steps here. Um, the Diani Barbosa fight was a robbery. Uh, Ismael Bonfim was, you know, beating Vince Bichel but couldn't find the finish. It's something that we talked about before the fight. Bichel is just so fucking tough, uh, so I understand that. Then Alessandre Pan or not Pantoja, Alessandre Costa um, finished Kevin Borjas in the second round uh, in a fight that he was just whooping his ass the whole time. The the athleticism, the difference in athleticism was very apparent in that matchup. And Borjas is a guy that I really like. He has a very interesting style, very um, cardio heavy boxing approach. Uh, but Costa's power and technique was just way too much for him. So you know, solid finish to start off the night. Altogether, man, it was a pretty solid fight card. The Brazilians showed out. I don't think many Brazilians lost, if anything. I mean, I know no, it was very lost. Yeah, pretty much everybody. If you were a favorite, you had a you probably won. Yeah, the only, like I think the they only, were. I think they were yeah. saying that like on the first, like even on like the prelims, I think they were like six and zero for the first one for the favorites winning. Yeah, uh, it all changed when um, Anthony Smith got that guillotine, but um, yeah, man. The Brazilians showed out. You know, the only ones that lost were Elvis Brenner and uh, Joaquim Silva. Um, so, solid night for Brazil. Solid night for the UFC in general. Uh, and, and Vita Petrino also lost. We just talked about that. But, yeah. Um, pretty solid car- card altogether. Uh, next week, and we are talking about it right now. We're going to break it down. We got Derek Lewis versus Rodrigo Nascimento. Uh, this is a kind of bullshit fight honestly i mean uh i don't think either of these guys are gonna sniff a title shot anytime soon but uh this is a pretty fun matchup and one that we've seen explored time and time again of Derek lewis versus grappler um Derek lewis versus grappler one of our favorite matchups in ufc history uh and i expect it to go pretty much how it always goes rodrigo nascimento is gonna have success early he's gonna get a takedown or two um Derek Lewis is just going to stand up, and then he's going to knock him out in the second, third, or fourth round whenever Rodrigo Nascimento is exhausted. Now, that might be the iteration of this fight, or it could be the other iteration of this fight where Derek Lewis just comes out like a madman and throws a fucking flying knee or a jumping switch kick or, you know, uh, any other combination of strange athleticism that you didn't know he possessed and knocks out <laughs> Nascimento in the first round, coming out of cold. Um, that could happen. Or Nascimento could kick his leg and be smart and move around and take down Lewis when he puts his back against the fence and win a very, very boring decision, a la Jalton Almeida. Uh, we'll see what happens. I'm not excited for it. What do you think, Jordan? What do you got in this main event? Oh, man. You just never know, man. You really never know what you're going to get with Derek Lewis. That's that's the that's the fun of it. Yeah. I hope we see a knockout, but if we start seeing it to be like a slow takedown stuff, I might be putting some live bets on it to go all the way. Yeah. Might be looking at that prop bet because I gotta imagine that any kind of like Derek Lewis one that it's probably not supposed to go to the to the three rounds. You think so? Right? It's five round fight. Huh? Oh shit! It's five... Excuse me, it's five <laughs> round fight. Yeah, I'm already on. I think about it. Five round heavyweight fight. You know what I mean? Like what is it? What's the what's the spread on that one for it to go to decision? Uh, I'm not sure. Let me let me check it out. But I mean, we're looking at a guy in Rodrigo Nascimento who's putting in split decisions against uh, Alira Latifi and fucking uh, who was that last guy they fought? Tanner Bozer. You know what I mean? These are not these are not world talents. You know what I mean? Nascimento has a, a solid game, but um, yeah, I don't know if it's gonna I don't know if it's gonna happen. Um. We'll see what's up, though. Let me pull up that that odd real quick. I hope to see Derek Lewis get the knockout in relatively short order. I hope so, too, man. I mean, just for the fan's sake, you know. So I, they don't have the odds out for that prop yet. Um, 
but you know whenever it pulls out. I'm more excited for the heavyweight fight that's kicking off the uh, the main card, but we'll get to that. Yeah, I mean there there's actually some pretty good fights on this card, honestly. I'm I'm just talking shit about the main event, and you know I'm I'm talking shit, but it really is going to be a pretty exciting fight. I think there's probably you know, there's potential for a finish on either side. But um, more often than not, I think it's going to be a slot fest, you know, which yeah. I personally love. But, you know, I'm maybe not a fan so much. Um, but, all right, so going down the card next in the co-main event, you got Joaquin Buckley versus Nurseltoon Ruzabayev. Ruzabayev is huge. He's coming down to welterweight in this fight. Um, he's like six foot three, I think, and uh, has a very hot first round and then tends to slow down as the fight goes on, where Joaquin Buckley also has a good first round, but builds as the fight goes on. Um, so for me personally, you know, Buckley's a lot smaller than Rusevayev. He's like 5'8 versus 6'3. Um, so there's going to be a big size difference in this fight. But I do think that Buckley has the experience edge. I think he has the cardio edge for sure. And I kind of expect him to get it done here. Um, it's been a while since we've seen Buckley get finished. It's been a while since he's been finished in the first round. I can't even, I don't even remember him ever getting finished in the first round. I know he's been knocked out by Chris Curtis. I know he got knocked out by, uh, um, what's his name? Uh, Kevin Holland. But those are both in the second and third round, respectively. Okay, so he did get finished in the first round by Alessi DiCarico by a first round head kick in that strange uh spin of things where him and uh Al Hassan and DiCarico Buckley Al Hassan DiCarico all traded head kick knockouts with each other. It was pretty cool. Um, but yeah, this guy. Uh, Ruzabayev, he's he's a pretty solid fighter, man. Uh, he's definitely a first round fighter, and definitely more of a uh, submission threat if you look at his record. But watching his style in the octagon, he really loves his hands, and um, I don't know, man. I think he has every tool to win, but I think as the fight goes on, it's gonna be hard for him to come back or to maintain a lead. So if he's not able to get Buckley out of there early, I expect Buckley to take over as the fight goes on. And um, maybe I won't put the bet on it immediately. I'll I'll watch the fight, and if Ruzabayev, uh wins the first round but looks tired towards the end or loses the first round, I am going to slap a live bet down on Buckley. So we'll see what happens. What do you think, Jordan? Uh, I'm leaning toward Buckley just because he is pretty hot right now. Um, I just, for me, his inconsistency makes it really, really hard for me to bet on walking Buckley. I never know which one I'm going to get. If I'm going to get the one that's, like, hitting, you know, highlight reel finishes or the one that's making low IQ moves. Yeah. I would expect him to get the win in this one. Um, if I do add him into my round robin, I'll, or if I add this fight into my round robin, it'll probably be walking Buckley money line. Yeah. I mean, they have him as a slight favor right now at, like, minus 170. So, you know, not a bad bet on him to be uh, for the money line. You know, I, I think... It's likely that he, uh, like I said, if he can use that cardio edge, he might be able to win a decision, or he can get a finish in the second or third. We'll see. I don't know. But I'm excited for the fight regardless. Um, and it's cool to see him get that spot in St. Louis in his hometown, so the crowd's going to be on his side. Um, oh, I didn't know that. And I, I'll probably lean more toward walking then. Yeah. I mean, he, he was asking for this card for a while. He wanted to main event it. But, you know, they gave him the co-main event next best thing. So good for yeah. Buckley. Um, next, we got light heavyweight affair between Alonzo Menafield and Carlos Olberg. This is a pretty interesting matchup uh, for me. Carlos Olberg is a tall, rangy kickboxer who has a very nice check hook. Um, seemed a little bit chinny at times, but uh, is a very technical striker and uh, has great knockout power. Um, Alonzo Menafield, on the other hand, is a more small, compact, explosive fighter. Uh, likes to throw big overhands and is a pretty decent wrestler to boot. Um, I remember him turning back that fake uh, record guy, uh, Askar Moksarov. If you remember that fight, that shit was funny as hell. Um, but, you know, most recently he beat Dustin Jacoby in a fight where he just outdogged him and was able to drop him in a couple of rounds and submitted Jimmy Crew af of, after their draw. Um, so, Menafield has been surging. He looks really good lately. Um, he he pulls a, a tough ask here in Carlos Olberg, who is always a favorite in his fights because of his length and his experience in the kickboxing circuit um, and his camp at City Kickboxing. So I'm really not sure who to pick here. Uh, the odds have Olberg as a pretty decent favorite at like minus 250, 
But uh, I personally feel like um, Lennonfield can get it done if he can crash on the inside and land a big punch. I can see him hurting Alberg. What do you think, Jordan? I don't know for this fight, to be honest. I haven't really studied too much up on either of these guys. Fair enough, yeah. I mean, it's light heavyweight uh, slop, you know, so we'll see how it shakes out. But I think I am going to go with the fight to end by knockout on either side. I think that's likely how it goes down, either Alberg finishing him early or Menafield getting him with a drop in uh, ground and pound at some point in the second round, probably. Um, then we have Carlos Diego Fajaya versus Mateusz Rebecki. This is a really, really good fight here uh, between the surging Mateusz Rebecki and uh, the sort of fading veteran in Diego Fajeda. Um I am expecting some really cool scrambles in this fight if they goes to the ground. If it stays on the feet, I do feel like Rebecca has a massive advantage in power and athleticism and youth, and I expect them to get it done there. Ultimately, I am going to pick Rebecca, but um, Diego Fajeda is absolutely a dog. It just seems like he's a little bit over the hump right now as far as his athleticism goes, so I'm going to have to saddle the younger dog in... Uh, Rebecca. Um, and then you got featherweight clash between two very strange looking guys in Alex Caceres and Sean Woodson. Uh, both dudes are absolutely huge for the division. Very long, very lanky fighters. Uh, Caceres has a bit better of a submission game and Woodson has a bit more power on the feet. Um, Again, a fight that I'm really not sure where it goes. What do you think, Jordan? You got an opinion on this one? Caceres? Um, I don't know. Caceres, I've seen him fight like once, and it's a very odd style. So I'm probably just going to watch this one. Yeah, I mean, you know, if you guys have never seen it, I definitely recommend you check out Caceres' five-round fight with Yair Rodriguez in Mexico City. It was five rounds of them both throwing a bunch of crazy spinning techniques at each other uh, and a split decision victory for Yair Rodriguez. Um, but, you know, to have that kind of cardio, to have that kind of wild, uh, fight with such a madman like Rodriguez, uh, and to do it in elevation at Mexico City, I have no questions about Caceres' cardio. On the other hand, Sean Woodson, I've seen get tired in his fights, and I've seen him make some bad IQ moves, and Caceres is a very savvy, experienced fighter, so I could see Caceres getting it done here, um... And I'm, 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 I am kind of leaning towards him. I, I like Caceres, so I, I'm, I'm going to lean towards Caceres here. Now, a fight that yeah. we called. We were very excited for this matchup. As soon as we saw Rebellus to Spain make his debut in the UFC against, um, I don't remember, Trucker. Uh, yeah. He's fighting now the Salsa Boy, Waldo Cortez Acosta. This is a matchup that we called for. The UFC, they heard us, they listened. Yeah, after that disrespectful show against the legend Andre Arlovsky, we called this. Uh, we were like, you know what? We want to see him do that dancing move in front of somebody that can hit. That's not not that Arlovsky can't hit, but like is in the prime of their hitting. So let's see Salsa Boy dance on this one. Let's see him get out of the first round. Seconds, yeah. yeah, with thirty <laughs> seconds. Let's see how that works. So let's see him dancing there. I'm excited for this one. I'm so excited, man. I, I'm i going to lay down a lot of money on uh, Rebellus <laughs> by first round finish. Um, I fully expect him to get Cortez Acosta out of there, and I can't wait. It's going to be so sweet if he gets that knockout early. Um, I hate Waldo Cortez Acosta. He, you know, he, he, he dances on his leads. He, he, he taunts legends and has a very boring style. And we're about to see. Stand. That's my thing. Yeah, that's my thing. Like, I don't mind the taunting, but you might you better have the flash to like to back it up. You know yeah. what I'm saying? Don't just sit there and like. Yeah, shake your your gut. Like, yeah, guy. fucking knock him out and then do that. That's what you're supposed to do. Like, yeah. that's what you're supposed to do. So can, I mean, hopefully, Despain can, you know, win our hearts over and <laughs> knock out Waldo Cortez Acosta very. Early and very violently. God, it's um, just the coolest name too. His last name is Dispain. Yeah, like. he's about to give him this pain. I'll tell you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm excited for it, man. Uh, if you guys aren't familiar with Orbelis, he, he only had one fight in the UFC where he finished dude in like 80 or like you know like 60 seconds or something. Um, and before that, his last three fights or his first three fights, I should say, um, 
they were all under 30 seconds combined. So the dude is a very talented striker. He's a Cuban silver medalist in Taekwondo, if I'm not mistaken, in the Olympics a few years ago. So uh, he, he hits hard. He has good technique. And he's huge. He's like 6'8". So hopefully he can find that knockout shot against Waldo Cortez Acosta. They have him at like minus 180 right now, which I feel like is criminal. I'm going to oh. slam the line. And um, as soon as those props come out, I'm taking Robles by first round. So I'm very excited for that. Somebody's um, going to be eating sushi next week. I'll tell you that much. Last mm-hmm. week we were eating burgers. Now we're eating sushi, you know. Uh, no, I actually did pretty well on the on the fight card last week. Yeah, it sounds like you did pretty well. Yeah, not, not too shabby, you know. Um, but yeah, so... In the prelims, we have some pretty interesting fights here. In the first one, this is a matchup that I'm really excited for because I feel like both guys have been improving, uh, and both guys have strengths that can highlight the other's weaknesses. Uh, you got Chase Hooper versus Vyacheslav Borshev. Borshev, a very, very talented striker uh, who has you know very crisp hands, very nice knees, um, and awesome combination punching. Uh, and he's fighting Chase Hooper. Uh, Borshev also, you know, in his career has been allergic to the takedown. If you can look at his legs, he'll fall over. But to his credit, he has shown improvement in that area, especially in his last fight against Nazim Sadikov. I believe that was his last fight um, where they went to a draw because uh, Sadikov was not able to get that finish on the ground like others have gotten so easily against Borshev. Um, he's fighting Chase Hooper here, who came up as a very talented wrestler or not maybe not wrestler but you know jiu-jitsu artist and now as of late has been improving his hands tremendously and has very nice combinations on the feet he has a nice sidekick that he learned from the wonder boy camp over there uh in in uh simpsonville or whatever in south carolina um so the guys he's starting to round out his game and we've seen him be super tough in his fights before like you know both guys have can take a shot um, so I really think it comes down to if Hooper can get this fight to the ground, I expect him to have some great success against Borshev. But if it stays on the feet, you're looking at a guy who's struck his, you know, who's been striking his whole life versus a guy who's learned striking in the last few years. And although Hooper has made leaps and bounds in that striking, I don't know if that is going to be enough to, you know, span the gulf between him and Borshev. And on the other hand, Borshev, somebody who's been improving his grappling much in the last few years, I don't know if his grappling is going to be enough against Chase Hooper, who's been grappling his entire life, oh, you know, as short as it may be. I think he's only like 22. So um, it's a very interesting matchup. Very much a striker versus grappler fight, but both guys can do both. I am kind of siding with Chase Hooper here because I feel like if the fight does get to the ground, I think it's going to be really bad for Borshev. But like we just said, Borshev's takedown defense has been improving. And Chase Hooper is not a strong wrestler. He's a good grappler. He's not a strong wrestler. So if Borshev can defend those takedowns, I think he, you know Chase Hooper's going to be in for a long night of pain and misery. Um, if Borshev can land those body shots, if he can land punches to the face. Uh, what do you think about this one, Jordan? Who you got? I agree with you. I'm leaning toward Chase, but that's also because I do like Chase. Um, he's a lot more present in the media, so I think that gets him a lot of, you know, sympathy. Not, I won't say sympathy, but like it endears people to him. You're right, though. He has been in, in improving on the feet, which I'm very glad because you could tell very, very early that that was going to be his biggest problem. And I'm glad that he's taken it, you know, serious enough to shore up uh, he, you know, these deficiencies and become such a well-rounded fighter. Um, I agree. I think this is going to be a great. A great, great fight to see how he is evolving as an MMA fighter, um, you know, in, his, in a, just a well-rounded game. So I'm excited for this one. I'm leaning toward Chase. Um, I think, and I mean, kind of what you're saying too. He doesn't have to take him down. He just has to get it to the ground, right? Because mm-hmm. you know he's just as dangerous on his back as well. So he could attempt to go for a takedown, not really trying to get him to the ground, but Pull guard or something. yeah, exactly. You know, I think that could be. You know, it, I think it's going to come down to whoever has the best fight IQ. Mm -hmm. I don't know if it'll be as much as who's better in a certain area. I think it's just going to be who makes the better decision, who implements the better game plan in this one. So it'll be an interesting fight to see, especially when, uh, you know, capping off the prelims. I think this will be a great, great, great fight. Yeah, I think that's a great read. I think it's going to come down to the decision-making of both guys. If we see Borshev, 
you know, engage in the grappling in any respect, I think Hooper is going to be able to have great success there. Um, and if Hooper ends up getting into a brawl, he is going to be outgunned by Borshev. So um, I'm really excited for this matchup, and I don't know even if it's going to go to a finish because they're both so tough and durable. Uh, I don't know. I, I'll, I'll make our pick, my pick when we get to the betting slip, though, for sure. Um, then you got Terrence McKenney versus Esteban Ribovich. Uh, Esteban Ribovich has a couple fights in the UFC, and he's pretty good. Um, Terrence McKenney, we know is a very hot starter and then fades quickly as the fight goes on so i love betting that the fight goes not the distance in the mckinney fights because he either you know kills you in the first round or gets finished in the second and that's probably where i'm going to go in this fight they have him as an underdog so they're clearly giving respect to esteban typically my rule is if terrence mckinney's fighting somebody making their debut or somebody you haven't heard of in the ufc he's going to finish him in, in one minute um but this guy's actually pretty solid so it's not as clear cut a pick for me um yeah, I'm, I'm just going to go with that fight to not go the distance, I think. Um, then you got Tabitha Ricci versus Tisha Pennington, debuting the new last name of her wife and now champion Raquel Pennington. Tisha Torres, as we know her her whole career, um, coming back after a decent layoff to fight Tabitha Ricci, the baby shark. Um, Tabitha's a pretty good fighter, man. She's, she's pretty well-rounded. Kind of reminds me of Tracy Cortez in a way where they're good everywhere. And, uh, if anything, you know, their clinch and grappling being their strong suit. Um, she's fighting Tisha Torres, who's just, she's just so damn small for this weight class and for any weight class that's in the UFC. Um, and as, as athletic as she is, is getting up there in age. And, uh, I think is probably, uh, starting to decline as far as her skills go. Uh, Tabitha Ricci, on the other hand, is certainly on the up and up. She lost her last fight in a split decision against Lupi Godinius, but we know the talent that Lupi Godinius is, and uh, so that's not you know anything to, to sniff at. Um, I am probably going to side with Ricci here, but what do you think, Jordan? Do you have a pick on this one? I actually don't know too much about these individuals, uh, to be honest, so I'm probably just going to use this one as a data-collecting fight. Fair enough. Um, these next couple fights, I'm really, I don't have too much to say about. I mean, Jared Gooden is a pretty fun fighter to watch. Uh, Night Train, uh, he's fighting Kevin Jusse. Charles Johnson versus Jake Hadley has some good potential to be a fun fight on the feet. Uh, Billy Joff versus Trey Waters has all the make of a slap fest. But this first fight that opens up the card, I am really excited for. You got J.J. Aldridge versus Veronica Hardy. Veronica Hardy, comeback tour. Um... You know, she, she's on a, what, two, three-fight win streak now since coming back to the UFC? Um, yeah, two-fight win streak over Juliana Miller and um, Jamie Lynn Horth, a couple of um, pretty unproven fighters at flyweight. And now she draws J.J. Aldrich, who I've always been high on for years. Uh, Aldrich is a very solid fighter with a very solid base. She has a good jab. She has a good straight. She has great grappling. Um, but seems to kind of be a little bit shopworn these days. You know, she's had some tough fights in there. Um, in her last two fights, she did get the victory against Liang Na, who, you know, we saw, we smelled that one coming from a mile away. Uh, you have something against Liang Na. She's just trying to fight and make her some money, dude. Man, she's making me a lot of money, let me tell you. By going <laughs> in here against anybody and getting finished, you know. Um, but, you know, and then J.J. Aldrich beat uh, Montana De La Rosa most recently. Aldrich is certainly a decision merchant. Uh, Veronica Hardy as well, as of late, has really been uh, getting more decisions than anything. Um, so I do feel like this fight is going to go the distance. Um, and personally, I feel like Veronica Hardy just has a little bit more in the tank these days. I think uh, she's just a little bit more ferocious, maybe a little bit more powerful. And although J.J. Aldrich is very strong in certain grappling positions... Um, I do expect Hardy to have much better striking on the feet as far as the kicks go. And if the fight goes to the ground, I think Hardy is a great scrambler. Um, so I'm going to go with Hardy by decision. I really like Hardy in this in these matchups. Uh, but against Shazia Aldrich, it's going to be a tougher fight than she's had these last few ones. I still feel like she has <coughs> enough to get it done. And the fight IQ is certainly there for her. So I'm going to go with Veronica Hardy here. Do you have a pick in this one, Jordan? I don't. I usually don't bet on too many of the early prelims. A lot of those are the guys that I haven't heard of too much, and that's my chance to uh, to start kind of getting a read on them. Yeah, fair enough. Um, all right, so let's go down the betting slip here. Um, 
Jordan, I'm gonna take. Wanna... Yeah, I got Derek Lewis by KO. I got Walking Buckley money line. Yeah, with him being the hometown boy, I think I'm gonna go with him. And then I got Robellus to Spain by knockout as well. I'm gonna slam that, and I'm gonna get Chase Hooper money line as well on that. I'm gonna wrap that up in a round robin. That's probably my uh, the extent of mine this this week. I like it. I like it. Some solid picks there. Um, I'm going to go... Uh, I'm not going to touch the main event, man. I'm just going to stay away from that. You know, Do it. I, I don't know what's going to happen. Do it. Yeah. Do it. I think, if anything, I'll put uh, Derek Lewis by knockout rounds two, three, or four. Uh, as the typical Derek Lewis versus Grappler script goes. Um, in the, in the co-main event, I am going to take Buckley. Um... Over one and a half, most likely. Um, and then uh, I like the, the the odds on Menafield as an underdog, so I'll, I'll put him in there too. And I'll definitely take Robelos to Spain by first round knockout. I'm also going to put a little prop on him to win under half a round on DraftKings. They have that prop typically. And if it's anything plus, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put something on it. Mm-hmm. Um, that Chase Hooper versus Vyacheslav Borshev fight, I am going to take Borshev. I feel like uh, if he can stop the takedown attempts from Chase Hooper, he's going to land some really good punches on the feet and uh, be able to win a decision or a late finish. I'm going to go that the McKinney fight does not go the distance. And I'm going to take Tabitha Ricci money line and Veronica Hardy money line. So all together, we're going to go Buckley by money line. We're going to go Menafield by KO. Uh, Rubellis to Spain, first round KO. Vyacheslav Borshev, money line. McKenny fight to knock the distance. Ricci and Hardy, money line, to round things out. And I'm, of course, going to round Robin, as always. Uh, and now, that brings us to the end of the show. Thank you very much for listening and watching. It's been a pleasure. It's been a long one. We had a lot to talk about on this card between UFC 301 and... Uh, you know this upcoming st louis card so thank you very much for listening next week we're going to come back with edson barboza versus lerone murphy it's a pretty interesting fight and a couple other cool fights on that card too so i'm excited to break that down thank you very much for listening y'all and uh have a lovely day peace out